Welcome everyone. So great to have you all joining us today for uh, a great session on the, the business emotional intelligence element uh, that's at play in our work, especially right now during COVID-19. And we're so uh, lucky to have Angela Hoyt of Evolution Group in Gananoque joining us for this presentation. For those of you who haven't met me before, my name is Carrie Ramsey and I'm the project manager for the We Can Project which is led by Queen's University and funded by FedDev Ontario. And of course, we're all about equipping and, and empowering women entrepreneurs in our area and beyond, really to help women entrepreneurs take their business to the next level. For some of you, I know that you're just starting out in business and you're most welcome here as well. I think some of the sessions that we've had, if I'm not mistaken, this is number 22 or 23 of our online workshops since COVID began, and many of those workshops, I think some of our more seasoned women entrepreneurs wish they had had when they were just getting started. So I think that whatever, le whatever level of business you're at right now, I hope that you're gonna get something out of today's session. We certainly do have um, an incredible presenter with us today. So uh, you'll hear from Angela just shortly. Uh, I would love uh, if you would do as Shannon has just done in the, the chat is just to sort of greet the others. Um, this is also meant to be a networking session for you all. And um, because we don't know everyone in, necessarily in the room, we'd love if you just take a moment to drop a note into the chat. Let us know uh, where you're connecting from, what your business is. Um, I think it's great. It just enriches the conversation and it also helps out, you know, as, as we go and as we're building um, our networks. So I'm just continuing to let women in from the waiting room. Uh, so again, I'm going to be behind the scenes today facilitating. If you have questions that you want to drop into the chat, again, most of you probably are aware, but the chat button is located in the bottom center of your screen. I think most of us have been on Zoom calls at this point, but there's always a newbie to the group. So uh, do make use of that, please. Um, you are all muted right now for the purposes of masking garbage truck sounds and pets and spouses, children, all the, all the things. So um, we will make sure to take you off of mute at a certain point in the presentation, of course. Um, I'll, I just as you're dropping into the chat where you're connecting from and what your business is, uh, I will mention that I'm connecting from the dish with one spoon today. And for those of you who don't know, that is known in 2020 as Belleville, Ontario, which is uh, just down the road from Kingston, Ontario, where Queen's University is located. Um, this is the traditional territory of the Huron, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples. And one thing that I've learned from my indigenous colleagues over the past few months is that uh, work, and life, culture, uh, the world we live in is a very multifaceted, multidimensional um, thing. And what we're learning about today, I think dovetails so nicely with that because we're learning about a, a dimension of business that frankly, we don't always take the time to consider. And if there's, um, you know, one thing I've learned about this season of slow, as I've started to call COVID-19, just this season of slowing down, is that we have been taking a bit more time to consider some of these other dimensions about what makes a whole business, what makes a whole entrepreneur. So I'm not gonna, I, I've, by the way, sat in on one of Angela's sessions about business emotional intelligence a couple of months ago uh, with YG Cares. So I am not an expert, I am learning alongside you, but I know you're in for a treat today. So I really hope that you enjoy yourselves Again, just as we're getting started, for those of you who are arriving, uh, definitely drop a little note into the chat as to where you're connecting from, what your business is, and as well, if you haven't already seen it, there is a file uh, that Angela is going to refer to shortly. If you've just arrived, you might not see it, so I'm going to upload it again in the next couple of minutes. But for now, Angela, I'm going to give you the virtual floor. Welcome, and uh, welcome to everyone. Wonderful. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you so much. So just so you know, and as probably you've noticed already, I have three, <laughs> three screens that I'm operating with. One is my presentation, one is all of you, and then one is the chat. So if you see me looking, that's what, that's what I'm doing here. 
Um, and then all of you here are in this little green light, I'm pretending you're all in this little green light. So Carrie, thank you so much for inviting me today. Thank you everyone for taking the time to come out um, and, and really invest in yourself and in your business and learn something new. And when Carrie says, you know, she's not the expert in business intelligence uh, or emotional intelligence. I find I'm not either. I'm, I'm, I learn something new every single day. And business emotional intelligence, some of you may be familiar with Daniel Goleman's work around emotional intelligence. He's really the one that brought emotional intelligence to the forefront that uh, people started thinking about it, you know, a lot, some research was happening before that, certainly, but in around 1998, he grabbed onto it. And since that time, you know, research on emotional intelligence, training, websites, whatever are out there. So if you just go Google emotional intelligence, you'll see everything that's out there. And I'll be talking about some references today. So a few things about me. One is, of course, during COVID I, and Zoom meetings, I have, uh, I live on a street and there is construction happening right outside my door. So I am hoping that these headphones are muffling that. So my apologies if you're hearing banging in the background, that's what it is. And um, as far as me, I started my business in 1999, which I realize now is maybe uh, when, children, when people were in grade school or even kindergarten, or maybe even sometimes haven't even been born yet. I don't know, that happens when I'm, when I'm working in a room. And I started out as an executive coach in the time when coaching was brand, brand new. It was, it was kind of snake oil, people didn't know what it was. Um, you know, we don't talk about, about business in it, we don't talk about uh, you know, how it can integrate into business coaching and that has certainly changed over the years too. But since 99, I've been a consultant, a trainer, a facilitator. My areas, uh, the sector I, I typically work in are workforce development and I know I have uh, some people, uh, longtime friends on the, the line today that I've worked with for years. And uh, so workforce development, so if you know Employment Ontario or any community employment program, community literacy, they're the organizations I typically work with. And I live in beautiful Gananoque, the gateway to the Thousand Islands. So to get ready, as Carrie said, there is a document in the chat that looks like this. So if you don't, if you can't access it, um, Carrie will make sure you have it after the presentation. If you can have it up on your screen, that's great. Uh, if you can't, that's okay too, but just so that you know it's there. And um, if you have two pieces of paper or your computer screen and a pen or a pencil or a marker or whatever you want. So this is an interactive session. We're going to uh, invite you to talk in the chat, but also there's going to be some head down work for, for you to do during the webinar. And if at any time I'm going too fast, uh, let me know through Carrie, through the chat, and then she'll jump on and let me know if I'm not noticing the chat, okay? And as Carrie said, we will be providing the slides. So, who are you? Are you blue, green, gold, orange, a bird, plane, train, automobile? What are you? And many people, have done employ or uh, assessments about that. What color am I? What, what, what item am I? You know, what utensil am I? And what's really interesting is sometimes I work with people and they'll say, uh, I did my assessment in true colors. I'm a blue, you're a gold. As soon as you learn how to work with me as a blue, uh, we will, everyone will be fine here. I'll be fine, you will be fine. And it's kind of not the point. The purpose behind any assessments that you've done, whether it's true colors, personality dynamics, Myers-Briggs, whatever, um, is really about how can you be more effective? How can you be more effective and how can you support others to be more effective? And what research has said and what leaders have told me and what I know from my own experience is that organizations use, often use assessments uh, let's say aptitude assessments to or interviews or whatever 
to find people who are the right fit for a company from a skill perspective. And what leaders and research find uh, has revealed is that companies will hire for skill and they're fire for personality. It's often that human interaction that is, is the challenge in work. So assessments and, and for people working together and getting things done. So we do bring our brains to work. We do not park them at the door. We are people, we are feeling people, we have emotions. And over the years, especially early in my business, um, managers would say to me, you know, come in and do this session, talk about what's going on here, whether it's our human resource or performance measurement or how we're delivering services, but this is not a therapy session. So I don't wanna talk anything about feelings and people. And because we bring ourselves to work and because we're humans, um, that has to be taken into account. I'm not saying that we're doing therapy, but we certainly have to acknowledge that that we have feelings around things, we have emotions around things, and those things affect our behavior, which do affect performance. So I'm gonna ask you how, and you don't have to put this in the chat. These are sometimes you're just like little points to ponder. So how are you feeling right now? So just touch into how you are feeling. And then next, how else are you feeling? And how often, so what's the feeling behind the feeling? How often do people say, how are you feeling? And it's good, it's fine, you know, I'm on the street. Yeah, I'm great, thanks. And behind it's, that's, that's not what's happening at all. So you have feelings, you have other feelings, you can have more than one feeling at a time and that's okay. You know, I may be crying, I may be sad, but I can also be very happy about what's going on in my life. So they're not so, so simple. Thank you, Barbara, for the feeling wheel there. So what are emotions? So emotions are a complex state of feelings that result in physical and psychological changes. So, you know, there, if whatever your way is that you respond to emotion, whether it's um, your hands get sweaty, it's like this, this autonomic, this feeling of, you know, I feel my hands are sweaty, my heart rate is rising, my, my face is turning red. And those feelings do influence thought and behavior. And one that I see often is when people cry, the first thing they do is they apologize for crying. And you'll uh, notice that, listen to that, see if you notice that too. And so they are, emotions are associated with psychological ph phenomena. So certainly our temperament, our upbringing, our personality, our motivation certainly impacts our feelings. And it, that physiological response, the, the heart rate, the blushing, the, the uh, sweating are the physiological responses. Now, I'm sure, uh, and I'm already seeing a resource there, there's lots and lots of resources out there that you may already know about uh, emotions and feelings and emotional intelligence. This is one and you can see it's like, whoa, this is a, a very complex around, around feelings, but just a resource that is one area that you may want to discover. So there's a lots of, you know, when you look at emotions, research around emotions, documents around emotions, they talk about primary emotions and some of them say there's four, there's eight, whatever. But, but primary emotions are innate they are about that fight, flight, you know, our lizard brain kind of thing. Some would say there's universal facial expressions. Others would say no, because there's cultural, um, because culture affects how we express ourselves, which we'll talk about in a minute. So the, the jury's out on whether there are universal face, facial expressions, but they're physiologically distinct. So these are the ones that we often see as the primary emotions, often considered as the primary emotions. And then we have secondary emotions. And when I think about secondary emotions, it's like the feelings around the feelings. And I think about my little neighbor uh, who's four years old. And when she was two, I would see those primary emotions. As she was 
three and four, I started seeing these secondary emotions. Like when someone said, her mom said no to her and she would hang her head like Charlie Brown. And literally she would, she, her mom would say no. She would be talking to me all happy. Her mom would say no. She'd drop her head and like Charlie Brown would walk off, you know, to her home. So there was something there around embarrassment or shame or whatever, but that, what I was seeing that head hanging was the emotion around the emotion, around the feeling, that primary emotion. So with secondary emotions, this is where the, the self-awareness comes in, the sense of who I am, the sense of who you are, that these are not innate. And remember, they're the feelings behind the feelings. They do emerge later. And like my little neighbor, you know, the chart, we learn the Charlie Brown uh, walk. We are not born with that. Um, and that it facilitates social goals. It helps with social bonds with other people. And there are no universal facial expressions about that. And later, we're going to talk about, you know, you may know people who are real, you know, we talk about poker face. They're the people you want to be a partner in, a, in, in poker if you're playing, I don't know if you're even playing partners in poker, but they're, they're people that are very composed and they're people that are much more expressive. So uh, it's, it's been said that secondary emotions don't have universal facial expressions. And this is where, again, the awareness comes in because you may think that someone is feeling a certain way by their, you know, what you're seeing physically, and you may be wrong. So you got to be careful about making assumptions, especially when it leads to action. And it is, it is complex. Emotions are very complex. And the self-awareness is about knowing yourself through time, how you mature, how you behave in different situations. So now I want you, if you have it, if you've got it on your computer, or, um, or a pen and a piece of paper, I want you to think about, we're gonna to touch down into how you're feeling. And we're going to look at this one to 10 around happy. So happy, I'm really, really, really happy, which is a 10, or I'm not happy at all. I'm probably feeling pretty sad, I'm around a one. So we're going to look at happy and we're going to look about uh, around motivation. So how does that feeling impact your motivation to get things done. So I do want you to be drawing on your paper right now, and I want it to look like this. So we've got happy, one to 10, low, high. Motivation, one to 10, low, high. And I'm seeing some head, head I'm seeing some videos and some heads down, so I'm gonna take those as my, my cues on how we're doing in the drawing, because I don't want to rush you and I don't want to take too long either. Doesn't have to be perfect, just good enough. We, we don't need perfect rectangles here. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the different quadrants here. So if you were up in high motivation, low on the happiness scale, so that's in the red. You may be angry, frustrated, annoyed. If you're on the low end of motivation, low end of happiness, there may be things that aren't going well today, so you might be worried, a little bit anxious, sad, not engaged. And hopefully I'm not gonna move you from like high motivation, high happiness to, you know, over to the angry, frustrated or below during this webinar. But high and high is happy, highly excited and happy, and then happy at a 10 and motivation as one, happy but not very energized, you're content. And you think about this in the work context of, you know, someone coming in in the morning and, and, uh, uh, the work around emotional intelligence and, and what they can do now with fMRIs and they can see the chemistry that happens in the brain, that we actually catch emotions from other people. That before we are even aware that someone is grumpy, our brain is already preparing for that grumpiness. You know, the, the stress hormone, the cortisol is, is ramping up. So we can catch moods. 
we can, we can catch that ener energy. So you may find that sometimes you go into work, you're all ready to go. And then someone there is like a wet blanket. It's like, no, I'm really tired today. No, I don't want to get things done today. And you can, you know, hopefully we catch the happy, excited rather than the angry and annoyed, but we can, we can catch those, those emotions and to be aware of that. But sometimes things are happening before you are even aware, oftentimes. So the thing to remember with emotions is that there's no judgment. There's no good or bad emotions, they just are. And if you can see emotions are data, that's all they are. And that triggers, so when something triggers an emotional response in you, it's a teacher. And so really emotions are like a big present with a big fat yellow bow on them. And so no judgment, no good, bad, they just are. And touching into your emotion about, and, and sometimes I'll find this, and you may find this too. Some days I'll think, I'm, I'm really feeling weird today. Like what is going on? Something is really bothering me. And then I just take a second. And I think what's really bothering me? Oh yeah, it's that. And then I can process what that is that I'm making an assumption about something, there's no milk in the fridge, whatever. But emotions are just data. What are they telling you? What is a trigger telling you when you have a big emotional response? And then what are you going to do about it? So they're teaching you something. So now let's touch in on emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence, and like I said, Goleman, Daniel Goleman really brought it to the forefront it's about understanding how emotions affect behavior and not saying I'm blue, you're orange, get over yourself orange because you have to learn how to work with me, but you're, I'm blue, you're orange. I'm just using an example, just a very simple example. You're orange, I'm blue, and how are we gonna get work together? How am I going to meet you where you're at because you are who you are and you're feeling how you're feeling? We're both taking responsibility, but I need to meet you where you're at. And how do we do that together? So the great thing about emotional intelligence, so the work around personality trait theory, personality trait theory says that personality is innate. It is, um, it is, uh, it is, um, it's like that nurture nature. So, personality is innate or it's learned. And by the time we get to be adults, it's pretty much hardwired. So personality traits are like height, shoe size, eye color. They don't change and there's no judgment. And certainly our personalities, you know, affect how we, um, how we interact with the world and how we behave. But let's just think about personality traits are pretty hardwired by this time in our life and uh, we can't change our personality, we can change our behavior. Emotional intelligence, yes, personality kind of forms the foundation of emotional intelligence, but emotional intelligence is a competency and there is a judgment related to it. And that is the more emotional intelligence you have, the better off you and others will be. So they are competencies that you can learn you can measure them, they are skills, they can be developed. And of course, you have to look at, do I wanna develop it? Am I motivated to develop it? That's another thing. But emotional intelligence, having high emotional intelligence does contribute to our satisfaction and success in work and in life. Now, what is business emotional intelligence? So it is about being able to focus on and manage. So this self-awareness of who we are and manage our emotions and behaviors according to the different situations. So I may have, you know, a comfort zone that I'm in with a certain area of business emotional intelligence, and we're going to dive into that in a minute uh, as far as what are the specifics. But I may have my comfort zone in an area of emotional intelligence 
and what I need to do, it's like a sound mixing board. I need to be able to, or like a volume button, I need to be able to turn up and turn down the volume of that area, that emotional intelligence area, depending on the situation. And emotional intelligence, it is about our capability to manage those emotions and behaviors that relate to work. So, you know, certainly the things that we learn at work benefit us at home and vice versa. But, but what we're going to talk about today are very specific emotional intelligence clusters or scales that, um, that relate to performance in the, in, in, at work. And by gaining an, in, an understanding about business emotional intelligence, it does allow us to work better with others. Um, for some of you, you are formal leaders of others in a team. For some of you, you are informal leaders. And I would argue we're all leaders um, and or have the opportunity to be leaders, whether we're formal or informal. And to remember, we as leaders, we have the ability to lead and mislead. So being able to know who we are and to manage our own stuff is really important for working with others and getting things done. So self-awareness. So there's two types of self-awareness. There's the intrapersonal awareness, which is about understanding yourself, and the interpersonal awareness, which is about understanding others. And the intrapersonal in understanding yourself, it's about managing yourself. And it's also about understanding the, the social awareness is about understanding the impact you have on others and the impact they have on you. So this is like really important in, we, you know, it's, it's important to be uh, conscious of this. That's what self-awareness is. And you know, there is, what, what we want to be is um, consciously, is that right? <laughs> I'm losing here. Consciously conscious. So we, there is sometimes we're kind of, um, sorry, conscious, in, conscious competence is what we want. So some of us go around in the world and it, again, it depends on the, the situation where we are unconsciously competent. We are doing something well, but we don't know why we're doing it well. We, we, it's just, you know, we're a natural. We can't touch down to what is it that's making us do well. So we're unconscious competence. Sometimes when it comes to emotion, we are unconscious incompetence. So we don't know what we don't know, and we're not very, very good at it. By with self-awareness, what it allows us to be is consciously incompetent. So it's, I don't know, I know I don't know, and it's that knowing that allows things to change. So if you are, after this webinar or beyond, realizing you are now consciously incompetent, well, you get a gold star for sure. So self-awareness is key to emotional intelligence. So, as I said, we've got intrapersonal intelligence, so understanding feelings, needs, wishes, wants, behaviors, and that interpersonal, which is understanding, engaging, managing, and motivating others, and choosing the response. And the response, you know, empathy is the empathy and communication skills are the foundation of that. So we've got emotions, behaviors, and work for people performance and personal performance. Now, the thing is interesting with emotional intelligence is the time we need it the most is when it's least accessible to us. So, you know, I may have a, an area that I am now developing. I'm aware, you know, I'm aware when someone says something, this is how I react. So now I'm doing something different. I'm going breathing, breathing, whatever I do. But on a day that I'm stressed, tired, not on top of my game, that all goes out the window. That competency that I learned of breathe, 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 you know, I may be you know, writing, a, writing a nasty email and, and pressing send. 
Um, I, I really try not to do that. But what, what happens is to recognize that we may have all the competencies in the world of, yes, I'm emotionally intelligent, intelligent but we, um, we're human and we go back to that lizard brain of that fight, fight or flight. And that, that's when we need our emotional intelligence the most and when it's so hard to access. And think about that times when you are stressed out and how difficult it can be to calm yourself even when you're you know, doing your best to consciously do it. So this is something, it's, um, uh, we're not perfect at this. It's a learning, it's a learning of competencies and we're human as well. Now, the emotions that seem to happen to you, you have to see that they are made by you in many cases. So checking in on when you take things personally, when you make assumptions, what more data you're gathering to test your assumptions and your hypotheses around things, because you have your you lenses on, right? You see the world with your lenses, with all of that, you know, your gifts, talents, experiences, nurture, nature, all of that, you are coming to the world and coming to relationships with that stuff, you know, with all of those things. So to recognize that your emotions are data and they can be data that doesn't have integrity sometimes. It's recognizing you're having an emotion and then dissecting it and understanding is a whole other thing. The, the other thing is, is recognize because of your emotions, because of your stuff, that uh, you, you know how we show up and all of those assets we bring to the world that um, that sometimes is where the projection comes in that you might think someone is feeling a certain way where that's really how you're feeling um, a, a reaction they may have in their what you're seeing in their face you may have decoded it not to mean what it means you know and I often hear that from people when they say, you know, I'm really composed. I just like, I'm great at a poker game, but people keep asking me what's, why am I angry? What's wrong with me? And I'm, I'm actually really happy right now. And I don't know why they keep saying that. It's because maybe they're more expressive and they're looking for, for the cues of that. And so context is important. Context is everything that relationships are important, that we feed off other people, that if I'm comfortable in a situation, I'm going to react differently than when I'm not comfortable in a situation. So EBW Global is, uh, it's called the EBW Assessment, Emotions and Behaviors at Work. And this is the assessment that I administer. There's lots of assessments out there, um, but I'm going to use this today just as a foundation for our discussion and giving you kind of a, a reader's digest version or a very quick 101 introduction and uh, about what what this is about. So what EBW has done is taking all of those different emotional intelligence indicators, traits, whatever, you know, researchers are calling them and people who develop them are calling them. And EBW has gone and said, what are those emotional intelligence areas that are key to success at work, key to human interaction and getting things done. And so what they've done is identified, um, there are seven and there's actually one more. So you will be getting this and that document that I see Carrie is, um, is sharing in the chat the document does give you definitions on these, but these are very specific to EBW. If you know other assessments, you're going to see similarities, um, but they call these things like the motivation, influence, adaptability, behavioral clusters or scales. And um, so these are the EBW ones and they have to do with behaviors and emotions interpersonal and intrapersonal intelligence. And we're going to dive into two of these today. So what I would like you to do, if you have that document, pull it out, whether you printed it, whether it's on a screen, or just take a quick shot, snapshot of it in your brain, and uh, you do have it, and I will be putting some of it on the screen so you don't have to read all of that. But just to give you an idea 
that there are eight um, behavioral clusters or scales, and we're going to dive into two of them. So I want you to think about just, we want to think about this in the context now, now when we're doing the, an exercise we're going to do is I want you to think about how COVID-19 has pushed you into or out of your comfort zone. So if we could just see some words in the chat and you take this however you want, how has COVID-19 affected you, you know, in how you get things done? What have you noticed about yourself and who you are and COVID-19? If you're comfortable sharing, if you want to just do your, your thinking, you know, and not sharing your own reflection, but how has it pushed you into or out of your comfort zone? And if one person could respond, that would be awesome. All right. Oh, committed to change that I'm resilient beyond imaginable resilience tested further. Wonderful. Has that changed? You know, I want you to reflect now on that first week. All right. Yeah, you've made it so far. Yes. Um, more time to reflect. Okay, so, oh, so I don't know if you can see the chat, but someone said, you know, I've been in healthcare for 16 years. It's kept you in your, your comfort zone, more of a hermit. Yes, what's interesting is I'm a hermit typically, and I've never been more connected um, in, in my whole life. You know, I'm joining groups, I'm talking to people, I'm doing Zoom calls, I'm like interacting with people. I've never been so connected. Season of the slow. Um, overcome barriers, fighting, yes, fighting, um, right, lack of, for Leah, the, the lack of supports, the lack of in, interpreters and captioning, it's exhausting, yes, and um, yeah, o overworked. And um, I want you to think about that first week compared to now. Is it different? Are you noticing a difference from the first week when for some of you, I mean, for me, I was built for this. As an introvert, I was like, yes, you know, and again, like I said, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've been more connected than ever. But for me, this was, yes, I'm working at home. I'm, I'm isolation is working for me. And then I got three coworkers of two adult children and my husband. It's like, I haven't had coworkers in 20 years. 20 years and now I've got to like, how does anyone, that's what I want to ask you, how does anyone get things done in an office? <laughs> that's what I'm thinking like, wow. Okay, yes, love to work at home in comfort zone. So is my immediate family. I'm hoping you can th see these chats reconnecting. Yeah, I mean, I've never cleaned more closets. We did our backyard that we hadn't done in 17 years, reinventing, yeah less and less motivated yes and i think people are having that covid yeah the panic fatigue fatigue so this is important to recognize yeah slow down and look at what's important the thing that i noticed right away is uh, my husband works for the ontario government so within the first week or two they had a lot going on different ministries working together who's got fabric who's got elastic who's got ppe who's got sewers all of this to hear what was going on. And what I heard right away in the last, in the first week or two, is how assistant deputy ministers, deputy ministers, you know, would have kids on their laps or the dog barking, things that were not acceptable before COVID are now acceptable. And I think that, that, um, that human part and seeing that, yeah, yeah, we really do have lives outside of the the office. So, so many comments, great comments here. I hope you can follow them and thank you so much for, um, uh, for sharing there. And it's a chance, this is about being conscious about where you're at right now. So, comfort zone, and it is interesting, if you feel you've been pushed out of your comfort zone, that is where the magic happens. That's where like great things happen. Of, with COVID, we were all globally pushed out of our comfort zone. And it is where the magic happens, where we do start to stretch muscles that we've never stretched before. So I just want you to think about, 
let's think about people that you know. And again, if you don't mind that we do this in the chat, think about someone you know in a work context. Um, in, in a situation where you think they're working outside their comfort zone, and if you can't think of anyone or you don't work with anyone, you can't answer this question from a, a colleague perspective, think about yourself. But how do you know when you're working with people and they're working outside their comfort zone? How do you know they're working outside their comfort zone? So again, if you wouldn't mind putting something in your chat. So this is, okay, so timid, scared, body language, agitated. So what does that look like? What does someone look like when they're timid or when they're scared, scattered, flustered, expressions, resistant? So with those, okay, hesitant, yes, holding back, complaining. These are really, these are the behaviors that you're seeing when they're outside of their comfort zone. And controlling, you know, wanting to get things in control. And also it's important for you to know what, what are the things that you do when you're, you're outside of your comfort zone or you're stressed, tired, not on top of your game. I used to work with a, an assistant deputy minister and he really had a hard time with his poker face. And he didn't want to, um, he didn't want to talk about personal things. He didn't want to talk about emotions or staff or whatever. And he was the type of person he'd get on the call with me and he'd say, hi, Angela, how are you? How's the family? Okay, let's get to work. No interest at all in how are, am I, how are the family, but he knew that he had to do some of that. So very disconnected from that relational part. So one thing that he did, he was working with an executive coach that said, you know what, I think you need to create a user guide for yourself. And not necessarily that you wanna give it to other people, but a user guide for yourself like a user guide for a machine would be. You know, like a coffee machine, the water is not coming out. Water's not coming out, put water in the machine. The, the, the machine's not turning on, turn on the machine plug in the machine. So he did this, you know, when you see this, this is what it means. When you see this, this is what it means. And this is what you should do about it. That for him was about raising his awareness of himself and an exercise for himself. I don't doubt he would have shared it with other people and said, you know, if everybody could just follow this, we'll all be fine. Um, but some really good, um, oh, someone saying they did that that uh, in their branch, Kim, on how you prefer to be approached, engaged, that sort of thing. That's great. So these are about interpersonal, intrapersonal awareness. And when you think about those people that you're talking about, and you know, so someone you can see in their body language that they're afraid and they do it anyway, did it make a difference? Does it make a difference in how you work with them and how? So if you're seeing people are outside of your comfort zone, do you, do you work with them differently and, and how? Super, super step. Now this is the, the thing. Um, uh, okay, so I just wanna go back to the comment from the person from, from Brandy, if you don't, I think it was Brandy, if you don't mind, um, that, you know, you're saying that the person would catch themselves and they tried and they came off as super stiff and, and uh, you know, not, not genuine. I worked with someone who the staff had said, you know, he's just not nurturing at all. Uh, he doesn't seem to care about us. He doesn't seem to recognize us. So they kind of did a baseline and then he worked on it. And then later on, they asked how he was doing, and it was worse <laughs> than he was doing before because it's like it, it's not it's it's it can't be you know I read it in the book or someone else is doing it, so I'm doing it. It's like what works for you? How do what's your different love language? And actually, uh, Carrie, if we could remember, if you could remind me that we can send this out later because there's some. Um, if you, if you don't know, there's a free assessment. There is a book, but there's a free assessment on the five love languages that uh, is interesting to see how you appreciate others, what they need from you. Okay, so um, 
again, we've got some of the comments here. It does impact the way that you, you relate to others. Um, you fake it till you make it. Yes, absolutely. So I'll tell you what I saw, what I've seen in COVID-19 from myself and from um, clients or organizations, leaders that I work with. So I'm going to focus on two of the behavioral, two of the clusters in um, the EBW as it relates to COVID-19. And remember, thank you, Carrie. Um, uh, so remember that how you were on week one may be very different from how you're doing right now. And I'll tell you, this adaptability is about flexibility. And recently I talked to a manager that they actually do the EBW and she was talking about their staff people that are on the left side. We don't say low or high because there's, um, there's no judgment, but if you look at a 10 point scale on the left and the right, so the adaptability was on the right, meaning that the flexibility, dealing with change, very difficult for those people. So the first week, two weeks, month, so hard for people. You know, getting used to working at home, having their office, communicating on Zoom, it was so hard and they were seeing a lot of emotion, a lot of frustration, people holding back, people being angry, whatever. So hard for some people. The people on the right side of adaptability, it was like, yes, I was built, built for this. I now can fly by the seat of my pants and no one's going to see because I'm working at home. So this was like, this was the party they've been training for. What's interesting is leaders are saying to me now, some leaders, this, this organization is saying, now that they're getting people back to work, the people that are the left side adaptability, that change is harder for them, are really struggling. So it was a struggle for them to work at home. Now it's a struggle for them to get back to work. And that the people on the right side adaptability, there's their own stuff going on as they've had the freedom to do what they wanna do and to do it the way they wanna do it, having to go back and actually think of people and how other people work. So in the first week, different than the fourth month and the way we are kind of our snug fit in these scales determines how we react, um, how we get things done, and where our comfort zones are. So we're going to be doing an exercise in a minute. So this is where I'm gonna to need to go slow and tell me to go slower if I'm going too fast. But the other one so that I noticed with COVID, one is the adaptability, the other is the stress resilience. And I'm going to go into, because these are two that I have, that have been so um, prominent that, that, um, uh, that so, yes, these are the two areas that I, that I see the most, in, the most visible of the adaptability and the stress resilience. So, and you've heard me say about self-awareness. So the self-awareness is key just by knowing awareness is curative. Just by knowing we are well on our way to, to working on things. So. And the thing about self-awareness is asking, are you self-aware? So we're going to be doing an exercise about self-awareness. Are you self-aware? How do you know you're self-aware? Are you asking anyone? Or are you just sensing you're self-aware? And at what level of awareness and at what impact? Does it, does it make a difference? And when are you self-aware? Are you aware before you do the behavior or after you do the behavior? And where it often happens here, where it often happens. So if you look at this as a, um, so we've got this circle and at the top we've got situations. So we've got a situation that's in front of us, maybe something's not familiar to us and there's emotions around that. And what sometimes happens is we don't even recognize that we have emotions <laughs> about that situation 
and we're acting. So it goes situation act, situation act, because we're not aware of our emotions. And therefore, we have that kind of lizard brain fight flight response. Self-awareness is about seeing, ah, I see a situation. I'm feeling something around that situation. I'm now aware of it. And I am making a choice and I'm doing something different. Because when we, potentially, when we go from situation to behavior, there's lots of messes, typically, that need to be cleaned up sometimes. Because I am reacting, which means I'm not gathering the information. I'm not thinking things through. So self-awareness is about seeing, oh, there's a situation. Oh, I'm feeling something about that. Now I'm aware of that and I can make a choice and I can implement behaviors that serve me and other people. So with this, when I talk about, we're going to be talking about a 10 point scale and hopefully now you have all been able to you know that you have this document. I will be talking about key pieces of it. Um, and if you don't have it, we'll make sure that you get it. But what this is when I talk about the left, right, this document has the scale. It has a left description, a right description, and a scale of one to 10, All right? So when we look at an area, so let's say, let's go back to adaptability. We have some people on the left around one, some people on the right around 10. We will have the outliers that are some people and most people are average. When we have the outliers, this is where conflict can happen. If I'm on the left and you're on the right, we're on completely different planets. So to recognize about yourself and others that we do bell curve and that we're not we're saying, well, I'm left on this and recognize that you're working with other people that are right on that, on the right side. Okay, so this is the document. You do not need to doc read this document or do this whole thing um, uh, during this webinar. I'm going to dive into the two. And if I'm going to too fast, just let me know. Okay, so on this document, and if you don't have it, it's okay. So this is how adaptability is defined. So I want you to think about adaptability on a scale of one to 10 and where you would put yourself. So just having a blank piece of paper right now is fine. Writing adaptability at the top. Adaptability is the desire for an enjoyment of variety in the workplace. Remember this is work context. The capacity to keep an open mind and be flexible with different and creative approaches. So if you don't have the document, that's fine. Write a 10 point scale on one side, on the left side, you're someone, a one would be valuing stability, liking clarity with processes and systems. You have well-defined views, and procedural thinking style. So clarity, stability. On the right side is enjoying change and novelty and loving that uncertainty and being very open to different ways of doing things. Creativity is important when thinking and working. So if you have the document, you can choose where you are. It's on page one at the bottom on the scale of 10. If you don't have it, then just do it on your blank piece of paper, one to 10. Now, so Judy is saying, my work involves both, both ends of the scale. So first well, of all- just, yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? Is this the yeah. same, this is the first document, correct? Or is this yes, the second? This is the first document. Okay. Yeah. So if anybody doesn't see it in the chat, you can scroll up a bit. If not, though, drop your email and I'll send it to you directly. Go ahead, Angela. Okay. So Judy was saying, you know, I do both in my work. And what I want to know is, if you do both in your work, you may fall between that four to seven. You may not be on the left or the right. 
you may be in the middle. And where is yours, when you really touch in, where would you say is your snug fit on that scale? You may need to do both, but where are you most, most comfortable? If you're saying, I can do either depending on the situation, then you would be in the middle. Thank you for that, that um, Judy. Kim saying love, um, uncertainty, but value consistent. Okay, so this is where in decision making structure, right? Love the wicked problems, but know how we're expected to brief up. So this is something where you see there's complexity in personality and complexity in emotional intelligence. So decision making or dis, um, decisiveness is one of the scales. So there are things that will definitely impact this, but I just want for right now, very simple to say, where is my snug fit on this scale of one to 10? Okay. Yes, so Amanda's saying, I like structure, but I don't want every day to be the same. Okay, so this is where, um, from a personality standpoint, if you're someone that loves change and you're an accident waiting to happen, Right, so I'm someone I would, from personality standpoint, I'm called low in structure. I like, like flying by the seat of my pants. I like change. Um, and I'm like the absent-minded professor, lots of ideas like change, but at risk of spinning my wheels. I need external structure. I don't like it, especially when someone else creates it. But I, the behaviors I have to do to keep me grounded are structured. So if someone came into my office, depending on the day, they may think, wow, you're really organized. It's like, don't open, you know, your fa space is really organized. Don't open my closet or well, wear a helmet if you're opening the closet and don't come on a creative day, right? So I know the behaviors of structure, of my journals, of my timetable, of putting things away. But when I'm stressed, tired, not on top of my game, I revert to that um, natural uh, tendency, which is low structure. So yes, yeah, so Trisha saying I was trained to be structured and I think I'm structured due to my career. And this tells us as, as humans and as adults, we can learn behaviors that do become um, hardwired. All right, thank you for the comments. Yes. Brandy says, don't come on a creative day. Exactly, exactly. Or don't talk to me. No eye contact on a creative day. Okay. So then I want you to think about, like, just think about pre and post adaptability, post COVID adaptability. Where were you? Where have you had to push yourself? Did you have to go up or down on the scale because of COVID? So think about that. Where were you before COVID and where have you had to be because of COVID? Yeah, these are great comments. Really appreciate this interaction. So now we're going to move to um, stress resilience. And so this is the capability to relax. So if you have the document, uh, it's on, it's the last one on the second page. If you don't just quickly jot down notes on that same page, you did adaptability. So this is about the capability to relax, to deal with day-to-day -day pressures, comfort with showing and managing your emotions. So can you control or hide your temper when you're provoked? And it's interesting, and I've had this discussion with a psychologist that's behind, you know, one of the psychologists that developed EBW. I said, you know, people that are expressive, they're not necessarily comfortable showing emotion. You know, it just happens. And I work with people, they'll say, Angela, I was really trying not to get angry. And I was like the blueberry in, um, in uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You know, I was trying really hard and really hard to, to hide my emotions. And then my head got huge and I got a red face and then I got hives, right? That, that, this is not, and then they're embarrassed about it and they're, they feel shame around it. That it's just like, if you are someone that emotes and expresses, it's very difficult for you not to and vice versa. 
So now let's talk about that stress resilience or that resilience divides into two. So we're gonna first talk about resilience. So write that on your paper. Resilience, the capability to relax and deal with the day-to-day -day pressures of work. So again, you have your 10 point scale. On the left side, if you're concerned about day-to-day -day work um, and managing pressure and you may find it hard to relax. So this is, you have a hard time letting work go when you close the door. This is really important as an aside when you're working from home, you know, how do you, what's, what's your virtual door? You know, do you have masking tape around? Like how do people know that you're at work and not to, to bother you? But just as an aside, it is important um, to set those boundaries. Um, we're not working at home, we're, we're living at work right now. Um, but on the left side, this is almost like the guilt prone anxiety, the waking up at night thinking about work. On the right side, is on 10 is you're relaxed you're comfortable dealing dealing with the day-to-day -day, um stresses of work there's really um uh you know it can go off your it can roll right off your back whatever whatever is going on it's like the door closed i stepped over my my line of masking tape and it'll be there tomorrow so i want you to think about again before covid and after covid where would you put yourself on the scale of resilience? Do you, or let, let's just say, yeah, it, and that may not be any different. So let's say, where are you as far as um, resilience about managing pressure? Can you relax? And if you can't, if that's difficult, left, right is, it's easy peasy. All right, and now we're going to go to the other scale related to resilience. So that scale broke into two, which is emotional control. And this is that piece about comfort with showing and managing your emotions. So can you control or hide your temper when provoked? Left side would be, you know, I've got hives, I've got, you know, people can see it um, that you, show your emotions and feelings and whether you're comfortable or not they just come out they're um you know they're they're uh um <laughs> i was going to say and i will say you know it's like a gassy day you know like it just it just comes out whether you need it to or not and so aileen saying yes i can relax it's a learned behavior absolutely it is these are where we're saying we can't change our personality, we can change our behaviors, and then sometimes that lizard brain jumps in. Okay, and then on the right side, left side, right side, calm persona, managing and hiding their feelings and emotions. It doesn't mean they don't have them, by the way. It doesn't mean you don't have emotions. Uh, it just means people don't know it, unless they know you well and know the, um, the micro movement. Uh, one coaching client I worked with, sometimes I would go see him and he was like stiff as a board. He, like his head would not, would not, like there was no range of motion in his neck. And what I knew from the work I did with him was that he was very composed. And what happened when he was composed is he turned into like, like a stick, right? That, or that special, when he was stressed and composed, he, what I could see was he couldn't even move his neck. He was not aware of that at all. And sometimes people write sign on emotion, they don't even realize they have emotion. Okay, so this is where this might get a little bit messy, okay? So this is a document and uh, thank you, Susan, for a reference. There's so much great happening in the chat. Carrie, I don't know if you can share that because it's so, so wonderful. Share, um, Carrie's going to share this one just as a resource for you and we'll send it to you later. Um, this is the EBW. You have it. You have the two sheeter. This is the, the full where it would be on one sheet just so you can see the picture of all of them together. And what's important with this 
is that things interact. We can't look at these just on their own. Things interact with each other. You know, if, if I'm someone that has, um, high, uh, I'm on the right side of adaptability, but I'm on the left side of influence, you know, I'm going ahead and making change, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not able to bring people with me. I'm not able to persuade and influence. So I just want you to see them all together and then, and then for you to think about that they would, would interact with each other. Is everyone doing okay? Thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> Those people, are y'all right? Okay, good. Great, awesome. Okay, so this is where we get kind of kind of tricky here. All right. So when you look at, and I should say with this stress resilience, we, like in the EBW, they give you an overall score and then they go into those two in detail. But when we talk about interactions, you know, you can be left, left about adaptability, right stress resilience, or maybe like this, or maybe like this. And it's like the behaviors are very different based on, you know, what you see will be very different. Uh, what people do will be very different with these interactions of all of these scales. So someone who is a right in stress resilience and a left in adaptability, maybe you don't know that it's hard for them when they're getting out of their comfort zone and having to turn up the volume to the right side of adaptability. So if you see these like a sound mixing board that you're turning things up and turning things down based on the situation and that right side stress resilience, right side emotional control, my goodness, empathy, right side, left side, what if I have to like help someone and then I'm having to turn up the volume, right? So these, what your behaviors and what the needs are um, and, and, and the action depends on the situation, but also, um, you know, depends on where you are naturally in these areas. So if you could just take a look at yours as you compare your, your one to 10, where you would be. The one thing when we look at these scales, the stress resilience scale, where we divide into resilience and emotional control, and this is important for you to know about yourself, but it's also for you to know about other people too. And that is, so remember the stress, the resilience, the ability to deal with stress, the emotional control, the ability to hide it. Just because someone is showing emotion. So I have a friend who, you know, she's a great debater and she, you know, the arms are flailing and the, you know, very dramatic eyes or arms are flailing, eyes are rolling when she's talking about something. And I'm thinking she's really passionate about this and it's really bothering her and she'll hang on to something and she'll build a huge case. And I'm thinking, how am I going to deal with that? I don't know how to tell her that she's wrong. And then she'll finish and say, but I don't really care what happens. I don't, I don't know. I don't, it doesn't bother me, whatever anyone does. So she likes to have her moment of the production with her emotions, but it doesn't mean that she's disappointed if something's not chosen or that it's going to stress her out that something's not chosen. It's just she's expressive. So you are going to work with people and maybe yourself as well that you might be, they might be left on emotional control. So you're seeing a lot of emotion, but they might be right on resilience. It's not getting to them and vice versa. Their resilience might be on the left side. They are under stress. They are guilty. They are feeling guilty about things. They, they are seeing themselves as not enough. So their left side resilience, but right side emotional control. You're not going to see it. They're not going to give you the signs of it. It's much easier for you to adapt how you work. Um, it's easy for you to adapt how you work when you see emotion. Now you have to check in with that emotion and say, I'm seeing emotion, does that mean this? But it's easier to work with people outside of their comfort zone when you can read it on their face. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, the question is about um, the, uh, my friend with, with 
this, you know, am I, am I seeing that if I'm understanding the comment, you know, that is genuine for her. She's not, she's not making that up. That is who she is. But if I think, if I interpret that emotion as meaning she's angry at me, or I have to change my behavior because she's angry, I'm wrong. I, I, you know, I miss the point of it. So this is where that knowing of is this person, um, is this person just expressive or is something really bothering them? I hope that makes sense. So it's seeing that what does the emotion, what do you see physically and what does it mean and what are you not seeing? And where do you have to gather more information? So this is where the dialogue, the conversation of, I'm noticing this, and can you tell me a little bit about that? You know people when you say to them, um, uh, you seem bothered about something, are you okay? I'm fine. So you're hearing the words, but you're not seeing that. And so you can't take that as, I'm fine. Well, you can decide, am I gonna dive into this, or am I, going to just leave it because some people just need their space. Yes, it is hard to deal. So one of the comments is it is hard to, to work with people who have significant fluctuations in their emotions. Um, this is the, the thing that the, the emotional control and the resilience are, are hardwired, pretty much hardwired. You know, if I'm an expressive person, that's who I am. If I'm someone that feels guilty about work, that's who I am. And what I would need is a nurturing environment where, you know, where a manager would know, you know, when I'm emotional, it, it doesn't mean that I'm falling apart and I'm not functioning. It actually means that something's really important to me. And then I'm feeling like I don't know what I'm doing. Right. So, um, so it's, it's just, it's just being aware. And this is, again, remember, emotions are data. So for us to see when someone's crying, if we're not comfortable with crying, that um, we can't judge they're crying. It's like they're giving you a gift of something's going on and it's something that's worth discovering. Yeah, and Judy said, it's harder if you're not that type of communicator, right? As a, either way, right? That. Uh, if you're working, if you're expressive and the pe person you're working with her is not and vice versa. Thank you so much for all of this, um, all of this interaction, wonderful. And so when you look at your scale on that resilience and um, emotional control, the stress resilience, emotional control, I just want you to look at, you know, do you have, are they both on the right? Are they both on the left? Is one on the right, one on the left, or vice versa? Are you in the middle? So the interactions of those two, and you can see here, right side, right side, you can cope with pressure, you don't show your feelings. Right side, left side emotion, right side resilience, left side emotional control, you can cope with a lot of pressure, and you're fine to show your feelings. You're, you know, you're expressive and that's fine. Left side resilience, right side emotional control, too much pressure may be really difficult and you don't like showing your emotions to others, so they're not gonna see it. And left side resilience, uh, left side emotional control, pressure is hard. And, um, and this happy thing, like I said, I've been talking to the psychologist about that. You do show your emotions to others, whether you're happy or not. And I do see that people are often very embarrassed about that. So if you are someone on the right side of, um, of emotional control, it's recognizing what is your physical response when you see emotion. And the other side too, what if you're someone that's very expressive and, and are you judging people that are not? This is all about awareness, right? And yes, Tatiana, the cultural, um, some culture is much more expressive and it's like, what is that? You know, so it's expressive and is there something we need to know about as far as resilience? Thank you, great interaction. The, I talked about resilience being kind of, or uh, um, um, Daniel Goleman being kind of the granddaddy of uh, emotional intelligence because he really brought it to the forefront. And 
in work, you know, leadership books, if you've done, you know, read articles, books, whatever, taken webinars on leadership, Sometimes people see leaders as, you know, what kind of leader are you, Carrie? Are you, do you lead from behind? Are you a coaching leader? Are you um, a, um, a servant leader? What are you? And what Daniel Goleman says, and he, he, with his leadership work, he brings it right to emotional intelligence. He said, you have to be all kinds of leaders because you have all kinds of situations and all kinds of people that you work with. So if you are a natural snug fit as a coaching leader, just think about when you have to be a commanding leader. Think about how much that will put your, you out of the comfort zone. If your comfort zone is saying, what do we need to do? How are you doing? You know, what is the situation? What do you think you need to do about it? To this is a situation, you have to do this now. This is, you know, where we have a, uh, there's an emergency, you just have to do it now. Think about if your natural snug fit is as a coach and you're having to be this commander. So again, when we talk about that soundboard of the emotional intelligence traits and scales, it's knowing what is your snug fit in those scales. So let's say that this person, this is their kind of snug fit on their EBW. So they're coaching, it's natural for them to be a coaching leader. And now they need to be a commanding leader. So I'm gonna go back and forth for a minute and just to show you what happens here. So this is a coaching leader. This is a commanding leader. It's a coaching leader. Now they're gonna to have to turn up and turn down the volume in a whole bunch of areas, right? Decisiveness being a two, having to move up to a 10. Imagine the pushing out of comfort zones. So this is just a little, uh, um, a little window for you into thinking about your leadership style. And there's lots of resources out, out there. And what is your snug fit as a leader? What does that look like from an emotional intelligence, business emotional intelligence standpoint? And where are places where maybe you're struggling because you need to be a different kind of formal or informal leader and there are areas where you need to stretch. Okay, so we're coming to the end here. I hope, uh, I hope that, um, I know it was a lot of back and forth and I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have, you know, um, send, me, send me questions, I'm happy to email you or, or chat with you, absolutely. Okay, so now we say, all right, now we have all this emotion stuff going on. We're more aware or already aware about, about who we are and how we react to things. And what do you do? So I'm assuming that everybody has some area in their life where they, where maybe it's an area where you are stretched out of your comfort zone or it is something that causes you stress. So if you don't mind sharing, what do you do to stay grounded in those times? How do you look after yourself? What does self-care look like? Oops. Meditate, remain aware that I control my actions and choices. Meditation, exercise, going to bed, excellent. Whoo, we've got a lot of uh, people that have done a lot of self work here. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm not seeing dishes yet, doing the dishes. Nature, yes, awesome. So there are some really good examples here and if people are not uh, baking, um, the physical activity, yes, difficult with COVID, unplugging, yes. Excellent. Yes, chocolate counts, Judy, for sure. And um, what is it? Moderation. Moderation, not deprivation. <laughs> All right. So think about how often you think about how you're feeling. And it can be, you know, sometimes with that meditation, it's just taking like a second to say something weird is happening right now. And what is that about? And do you think about how others are feeling around things and remember their data and you may be wrong. Your hypothesis may be wrong. So then you think about what impact do your emotions have on others, their behavior and performance. 
and what impact do theirs have on you? And some of us, depending on where we are, you know, what our personality looks like, where we are with empathy, some people are like a sponge, you know, they pick up other people's emotions and sometimes they don't even know, like, is this my problem or someone else's problem? They pick up other people's baggage and no one asked them to pick up the baggage or maybe they did but they also have a hard time to say, I notice your baggage, here is your baggage. So to recognize that for some of you, separating what are your feelings and other feelings, if you're very intuitive, sometimes that's really hard, and recognizing what are the behaviors that you do when you're under stress, when something is unfamiliar to you, when someone else is, is emoting, what happens? So this is a great resource and we will send you this, uh, Carrie, I think it's just maybe sixseconds.org or something like that. So emotional intelligence is about knowing yourself and I see it here in the, in the comments. It's about knowing yourself, choosing yourself. So I saw that comment and, and give yourself. So who are you? Like, what is the legacy you want to leave? How do you want to show up in your life, right? How do you bring yourself to others uh, and to the world, right? What's the big picture for you? Because sometimes, you know, the lizard brain and that immediate, you know, if I have things that are um, bothering me and I react in a certain way and someone else catches that and now it affects them and we're all we're all responsible, you know, I don't have the, the power to, um, to control other people's feelings, but I certainly contribute to the environment and contribute where they're coming from. But it is, you know, so there may be areas that I react, my lizard brain react, where, you know, it affects other people. And in my big picture of giving myself, I want things to work for people. I want people to, to, to like to work with me, to have value in working with me. So it really hits me when I do something that is not authentic, contrary to that. So just very quickly, here are some things, and I already see some great e examples of, um, of ways that people keep themselves grounded. And again, it's that self-awareness, the breathing, noticing when you're compressed and it can actually just be pulling your shoulders back. So using your physical body to transform your emotions. And it's amazing how even just getting up from your desk and walking around can make all the difference in the world. Facing ad adversity, and this is something in the very beginning with COVID and even now, you know, facing ad adversity, doing the three Ps. Am I thinking this is permanent? You know, and is it permanent? Do I think it is pervasive? Is it changing everything? And I, am I giving up or taking too much power? You know, so becoming maybe lower in responsibility that, you know, poor me, this is not changing. We can only control what we can control and we can often control more than we think we can. And as someone said, you know, when someone's stressed, they may get more control um, and try to get more control. So it's just looking, you know, is this permanent? Well, I think, you know, I think our lives have definitely been changed by, by COVID. And I think, you know, it's been the worst and the best of times for people depending on their lives. Um, and, uh, and I'm hoping good things will come out of it. But uh, we are, you know, what can we control? We can only control what we can control. And sometimes we can control more than we think we can be and do. And, and as I said, you know, whether you're looking at your own emotions or others, be a detective, emotions are data, gather the, the evidence, and if they're inaccurate, dispute them. Practice the power of yet. This is the one that is so powerful for me, and I know my family gets very annoyed because I often say yet. You know, so it's like, well, I've never done that. You know, I've always done this. Or let's say, I've, I've never done that. I'm never going to be good at that. I've never been good at that yet. I've always done it. The other thing I love to say, yet, you can see how that would be annoying as a spouse or a, or a mother, right? Yet. You know, I have no, I have no skills to empty the dishwasher yet because I'm going to, to, uh, to teach you right now. <laughs> or um, people saying, 
you know, uh, it's, it's just the way things I do things. I always do things. I always make things uh, dramatic. So my response to that is until now, until now, because now, you know, and now you can make a, a choice of doing things differently. Strengthen your optimism pathway. And this is where that meditation comes in. Uh, looking at what really is the problem and writing down two quick solutions to address that problem. And, and that is, you know, in my coaching, people will say, I, I don't know what to do. It's like, okay, so if you do know, I don't know what to do. If you do, did know what to do, what would you do? And they're like, oh, that's so annoying, right? But it is going beyond that. I don't know what to do to, if I did, what would it be? And, um, uh, you know, done is better than perfect sometimes. Good enough is good enough. And I know for some people on the line, it must be hard to hear that perfect. Like not everything needs to be perfect, it's perfect enough. And be driven by the power within. Who are you? What is your intent in life? Um, that uh, as Goldman says, ultimate well-being has nothing to do with what's outside of us, right? How do we, who are we? How do we want to show up and what does taking charge of our lives look like when we control what we can control? So the thing is, is it's not about emotional intelligence. It's not about changing who you are. You know, we can't change your personality, but we can change our behaviors and we can kind of hardwire those behaviors. It's learning about how to manage yourself and your relationships. Uh, so for example, and some people said, you know, I, I, I've learned how to do this as a leader. So you can learn to, and, and this is not assuming that an introvert could never be uh, an excellent leader, but sometimes people think, oh, especially extroverts think, oh, he's an introvert. He'll never be a great learner leader. Well, that's not true. And we know that's not true. There are skills to learn. And, you know, for introverts, they just get their energy internally, not externally. They may need naps. They may need time away, but there's no judgment on how we gather our information. So what do we do? I love the work of Timothy Galway. So again, you're going to see that. Love the work of Timothy Galway and the, the principles of mobility. So he says, very simply in life, motivation is all about, or performance is about, the big P is performance equals potential minus interference. So potential, we have great potential. We can get that through tending things like this, reading, learning from other people, and minus interference. And that is our inner critic, our inner noise, the construction happening outside my house, the dirty dishes in the, in the, the sink, whatever. Like what are the energy leaks that you have um, and that, that keep you from doing your best, your best work? So he said, in order to kind of have that performance, there's three things under the acronym ACT. Awareness is curative. Just by knowing something's not working, you are already on your way to solving it. So you are consciously incompetent. Yay, gold star. Having clarity of focus. This is where I am now. This is where I want to be. Focus is vision. It's about creating tension to where you are now, to where you want to be, and having that clarity about who you want to be as a leader, how you want to show up at work. And that it is amazing that when you make that commitment to that focus and when you're aware, how many things show up. So it's about trusting yourself and others, trusting timing. We arrive right on time and respecting all of that. So hopefully I haven't moved you out of the, you know, the, the right side into the left side during the, the, this webinar. And my, my recommended next step for you is just notice. Notice, notice, that's it. This is the awareness. Notice what things get you excited, what things get you sad, what things get you stressed, what you notice about other things, and what's, what are your go-to behaviors when you're happy, sad, stressed, and others too. And again, remember, emotions are data and triggers are teachers. So I just want to thank you so much um, for attending the webinar today. I hope you are leaving with some more information and a greater understanding. And that is an understanding too on the strengths that you bring to the table, the emotional intelligence that you do have that you bring to the table and that others can learn from. 
So thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. And I'm just uh, dropping Angela's website into the chat, everyone, in case you'd like to connect with her, to ask her a question perhaps, or to follow up on, on this big topic that we've yes. basically done 90 minutes of scratching the surface. <laughs> uh, it has been such a pleasure to have you, Angela, and uh, you. you're just a fountain of knowledge. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for the activity in the group. It's always so much uh, more lively uh, and interesting, I think, for even the presenter when, when yes. people are participating. So this is an amazing group of women. I have put into the chat as well uh, next week's weekend event, which is our second virtual cafe. It's more of a discussion style than a presentation, but I did put the link in there if anyone's interested, or you can email me directly. Um, certainly, uh, we would love to have you participate as well. Um, and if you would like a recording of today's session as well, just email me. I'll put my email into the chat one more time as well. So I know that we're out of time, everyone, uh, but thank you so much. Um, if for some reason you had trouble getting the handouts, again, email me. We'll make sure that you get those, and I'm sure Angela will be happy to follow up with a, a question or two afterwards um, uh, on uh, offline, I suppose, uh, yeah. if, if that's of interest. So thank you, everyone, for attending. It was so great to have you all, and I'll just put my email in the chat one more time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, everyone.